everybody. Welcome to Who's Left, a podcast about Indiana politics, history, and culture from the unapologetic perspective of the Hoosier left. My name is Scott Aaron Rogers, and I am broadcasting from Bloomington. So, friends, the calendar has turned to autumn. Footballs fill the air, as does that first sweater-necessitating chill. Pumpkin spice mornings turn into ever shorter Oktoberfest nights, and all the little children are fully immersed in school. But all is not well in Indiana schools. A rash of irredeemable behavior has many parents concerned. But it's not the kids acting out. It's other parents. Now, it seems every school has fat PTA mom. When I was a kid, it was Mrs. Hanish. But the uh, quote-unquote parental rights activist group Moms for Liberty has taken it up several notches turning classrooms, school board meetings, and libraries into an active battlefield culture war, attacking any accurate depiction of American history that might detail some of our less savory moments, uh, attacking that as critical race theory, uh, decrying diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, initiatives as reverse racism. Um, going after the LGBTQ commun community um, by passing don't say gay bills in Florida and other states uh, and, and, and advocating for book bans, book bans in 21st century America. That is some Nazi Germany shit. So today we're going to look at this group, Moms for Liberty, who they are, where they came from and what it looks like when they come to your community. Uh, but first, some housekeeping. Uh, if you are new here, Welcome. Thank you for listening. Um, if you do not yet subscribe, I post my writings and research over on Substack at scottaaronrogers.substack.com. I'm also available on the social, uh, social media networks, Twitter or whatever it's called these days, Facebook and Instagram at scottroj78, S-C-O-T-T-R-O-G-7-8. Uh, we do have a Who's Left page on Facebook, so follow us there. Um, and, and and sure, uh, uh, this is the part where I'm going to ask you to give me money <laughs> and, and and request a, uh, a paid subscription over on Substack. Uh, but more than that, I think the most important thing you can do is share with somebody. We are trying to build a community here of disaffected Hoosiers who are terribly disappointed with the way the Republican supermajority has run the state for the last dozen odd years now. So, with that out of the way, who are Moms for Liberty? By the numbers, as of July of this year, the organization has 285 chapters in 45 states. Uh, in 2022, slightly more than half of the 500 school board candidates it endorsed across the country won. Stick a pin in that. Now, According to Moms for Liberty, they are a 501c4 social welfare, uh, welfare organization, quote, dedicated to fighting for the survival of America by unifying, educating, and empowering parents to defend their parental rights at all levels of government, unquote. What they also say, quote, he alone who owns the youth gains the future, and quote. That little number led off the first newsletter from the Hamilton County, Indiana Moms for Liberty chapter this June. Uh, that quote was from some uh, Austrian guy. Uh, hit, hit, Hitler? Hitler? Yeah, that, 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 that Hitler. According to the Southern Poverty Law Center, quote, Moms for Liberty is a far-right organization that engages in anti-student inclusion activities and self-identifies as part of the modern parental rights movement. The group grew out of opposition to public health regulations for COVID-19, opposes LGBTQ plus and racially inclusive school curriculum, and has advocated book bans. Unquote. So before we dive into Moms for Liberty themselves, let me point out that organizations like this are not unique, and there is a long history in this country of groups of white women using the... Um, shield of you know the perceived innocence of white femininity and oh and their children think of the children um and they've used this as a shield uh 
to protect them as they've put forth horrible reactionary policies. For example, if you uh, rewind back to the generation after the Civil War, a little group called Uno uh, United Daughters of the Confederacy, uh, Confederacy popped up. And uh, they, they came into existence because, they, you know, they didn't want to see their daddies and their bro brothers go down in uh, history as, as these, these bad guys, these losers of the Civil War. So they perpetuated this little thing called the Lost Cause Myth. And I'm sure you know the Lost Cause Myth already, even if you don't know you know it. And it goes a little bit like this. See... The antebellum South, that was, that was just a, a, a simple Christian way of life, and 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 you see the the Civil War was was a war of Northern aggression because, um, you know they they didn't approve of that simple Christian way of life, what with their owning people and whatnot. But see that was. That was for their own benefit, right? Because those those poor folks had been cursed by God and 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 were destined to live a life of servitude and would not know what to do with themselves without their benevolent master's guidance. Um, and and the Civil War wasn't even about slavery. See, it was about states' rights. And this group, the United Daughters of the Confederacy, planted monuments all over the South. But more importantly for our purposes today, they also propagated uh, history curricula, forwarding the lost cause myth that in many places still perpetuates to this day. Now, generation after that, in the 1920s, the height of the second Ku Klux Klan, uh, especially here in Indiana, I just finished uh, a, a book, uh, Fever in the Heartland by Timothy Egan. Highly recommend. Talks all about the uh, uh, the Indiana Klan in the 1920s. Um, who had a women's auxiliary? Because, you know, a lynching is a good time for the whole family and someone's got to bring a hot dish. These women were called Lotties, Ladies of the Invisible Empire. My mom has a cat named Lottie. I'm, I'm sorry to have learned this, and I'm sorry to be telling you this, Mom. <laughs> but if you uh, fast forward past the, uh, the Second World War, you get into the Brown versus the Board of Education decision that um, struck down segregation in public schools, there was uh, what was called, quote, massive resistance in the South, um, where certain communities, particularly in uh, Virginia, but, but but elsewhere, they they would they would shut down their public schools entirely rather than desegregate. Uh, also, the concept of vouchers comes from this particular time period, uh, as other communities opened up private, all white, quote unquote, Christian academies, um, where they would send the white kids. So they didn't have to go to public school with the black kids. And, and they wanted the public to pay for this, of course, as they still do. Moving on, there was a group of suburban moms in California called Mothers of Conservatism, because this was not just limited to the South. Roar, Restore Our Alienated Rights, was an anti-busing group in the 70s, as uh, fighting for segregation itself became less favorable fighting against the method of desegregation be, be, became the, the, the new front. Um, similarly, as it became less popular to be an overt racist, the culture war moved on to the gay community. In the late 70s and early 80s, there was a singer, Anita Bryant, and uh, the Save Our Children movement who uh, gave us the uh, groomer slur, as it is, um, their logic being, see, that the gays don't reproduce naturally. It's not naturally occurring. It's deviant behavior, and therefore they have to recruit. <clears throat> Just disgusting stuff. 
as you get into the last couple decades and about my timeline, uh, when I was a kid, I remember the satanic panic and uh, the parental music uh, resource center, Tipper Gore, and the Senate hearings with Frank Zappa and uh, D. Snyder from Twisted Sister and John Denver, of all people. Uh, find those hearings on YouTube. They are great. Those guys eloquently stood up against the kind of censorship pushed by um, the screeching Karens of their day. Back to the screeching Karens of our day, we're going to look at Moms for Liberty here, uh, starting with a piece from Maurice Cunningham in the Tampa Bay Times from last summer. Um, great article. I will link to it in the notes. Comes out of Florida because that's where Moms for Liberty started, uh, as the greater Sarasota area is the, uh, the pit whence uh, American fascism pours forth. Anyway, in Cunningham's article, uh, he uses a four-part test des uh, devised by education researcher Daniel Katz to flesh out whether uh, this group is a real grassroots movement or if it is something called an astroturf movement. See, fake grass. Made to look like a real grassroots movement, but is in fact fake. And a convincing one, like Moms for Liberty, is is even more like more than AstroTurf, it's like that new fields, me field turf stuff, which looks just like real grass, but will destroy your Achilles uh, with apologies to a certain meat-headed New York Jets quarterback. Anyway, back to the four-part cat's test. So the, the four questions he asks are, is this group growing at a pace that only a corporation's monetary resources could manage? Well, let's answer that. Um, here's a quote from Media Matters. Quote, Moms for Liberty received 501c4 nonprofit status on January 1st, 2021, and by January 27th, co-founder Tina Deskovich had already appeared on the Rush Limbaugh show. Moms for Liberty nationally launched on February 8th with only five chapters. By the end of February, the group had been spotlighted by Breitbart and had received a shout-out on Tucker Carlson tonight. Attention from right-wing media only grew from there, with the group being featured in an interview with Glenn Beck and multiple Fox News segments in the following months. What can't be emphasized enough is just how small Moms for Liberty was when major media attention began and how crucial that coverage was to the group's expansion. With influential right-wing media figures functionally recruiting their eager audience to join the organization. As media attention to the group increased, new chapters were created and more members joined. Just six months after its launch, Moms for Liberty was connected enough to have conservative Megyn Kelly host a fundraiser on its behalf, and right-wing media outlet The Daily Wire praise it as one of the fastest growing and most robustly organized groups. At seven months old, Moms for Liberty claims that it had grown to 30 chapters in 18 states, which was followed by attention from Newsmax and more Fox News publicity. At 10 months, Moms for Liberty left to 135 chapters in 35 states, and by July 2022, Moms for Liberty claimed it had grown to 200 chapters in 38 states. Uh, well, uh, so that looks like a pretty well-resourced group. Who is resourcing it? That is question two. Who is funding the group and for how much? Another quote from Media Matters. In an interview with education news site The 74, Deskovich again hiked the claim that the group sells, quote, a lot of t-shirts, unquote, and that's its biggest funding source right now. Its annual budget is allegedly about $150,000 and, according to Deskovich, funded mostly by just small donors. Well, the Bucks County Beacon of suburban Philadelphia says otherwise. They have located a $50,000 donation from Julie Fancelli, uh, heiress to the Publix supermarket fortune, who also contributed $300,000 toward uh, the January 6th rally slash coup attempt. In 2022, they also got a uh, $50,000 presenting sponsorship from the Leadership Institute and another $50,000 from the Leadership Institute and one from the Heritage Foundation 
in 2023. Both of those groups, the Leadership Institute and the Heritage Foundation, are intimately intertwined with the shadowy Council on National Policy, uh, about whom I wrote uh, a few months ago on the old Substack in an article entitled Six Degrees of Segregation. Um, Moms for Liberty also has a corporate tie-in with pa Patriot Mobile, America's only Christian conservative wireless provider who sponsored uh, former President Trump's speech at the 2023 Joyful Warriors Summit. Uh, apparently, when you switch to Patriot Mobile, a portion of your monthly bill goes back to Moms for Liberty. Um, so, that uh, is a lot more than independent t-shirt sales. Who is really running this thing? The two co-founders are Tiffany Justice and Tina Deskovich, uh, former school board members in neighboring Florida counties. Uh, Justice, from Indian River County, um, made her mark by uh, when serving on the school board um, because of her frequent inappropriate outbursts. Uh, and she even attacked local news coverage of the school board during her term. Uh, her big blow-up moment, however, was visiting her fifth-grade son's school to oppose the district's COVID-19 mask mandate. And she was... Um, Quote, being so disruptive and disrespectful in her interactions with Beachland teachers and administrators that the school superintendent warned she could be barred from the campus. Unquote. Other founder Deskovich uh, from Brevard County, uh, Florida, uh, is the executive director, and I want you to listen to her uh, LinkedIn bio. Ready. A Creative senior communications professional with experience in strategic message delivery, media relations management, brand and graphic development, stakeholder engagement, government relations, corporate relations, crisis management, critical thinking, and problem solving. Um, so translated from corporate bullshit into English, that means she is a communications professional. She's a Republican comms professional. But more so, their intimate ties with the Republican Party show through when you come across Bridget Ziegler, the secret third co-founder. Um, her husband, Christian Ziegler, is the chair of the Florida Republican Party, uh, who once said to the Washington Post, quote, I have been trying for a dozen years to get 20 and 30 year old females involved with the Republican Party, and it was a heavy lift to get that demographic, but now Moms for Liberty has done it for me. Unquote. He also said he expects Moms for Liberty members to, as the Post puts it, become foot soldiers for Florida Governor Ron DeSantis' re election campaign. Uh, Ziegler served as a media surrogate on Donald Trump's 2016 presidential campaign and was once a Heritage Foundation congressional fellow. Hey, there's those guys again. So the Post reported that um, Bridget Ziegler is loosely aligned with Moms for Liberty. In reality, um, she, a Sarasota County school board member, uh, is listed on the initial Moms for Liberty Incorporation document as a co-director. And Deskovich credited her as such in December of 2020. Finally, um, there are two more operatives listed among their directors. There is a, a lady named Marie Rogerson, who has been a Republican campaign operative in Brevard County since 2015. Rags of knocking on over 12,000 doors as part of the Space Coast Young Republicans. Um, and finally, Pat Blackburn, who has, like, no internet footprint that I can find, is the Facebook mod in just about every county chapter's private Facebook group. So she's the person actually coordinating with locals on the ground, it so appears. Now, the last question in this four-part test is, do its supposed grassroots members even have a clue what the organization is about. An Associated Press article by Jill Colvin and Ali Swenson um, sheds a little light on that. 
they talked to Lucy Reyna, a treasurer for Moms for Liberty chapter in Indiana, and uh, who said she traveled to the conference, uh, that was the Moms for Liberty Joyful Warrior Summit here in 2023. Uh, she learned, or she traveled to that conference to learn more about the national organization and said, quote, what am I a part of? I need to know those things, unquote adding that if the group leaned too partisan in one direction, it would make her free consider her participation. So uh, that one Indiana chapter treasurer certainly must not know what the organization is all about. Now, Miss Reyna brings us back to Indiana. There are seven chapters in this state. Um, Allen County, that's the Fort, uh, greater Fort Wayne area. Cass County. Uh, that's Logansport and the old Grissom Air Force Base area. I believe Reyna is the treasurer there. Howard County, that's Kokomo. LaPorte County, that's my old stomping grounds. That's where I'm from. Michigan City, Port. You guys disappoint me. Uh, Tipton County, Warwick County, that is uh, the bougie suburbs east of Evansville. And finally, speaking of bougie suburbs, Hamilton County north of Indianapolis, Carmel, Fishers, Noblesville. They are the largest and um, most active of the Moms for Liberty chapters in the state. Candidates they endorsed won a school board seat in Carmel last year and four uh, at the Hamil uh, Hamilton Southeastern District. So I went to a Hamilton County resident to talk about what it looks like on the ground when Moms for Liberty invades your community. My guest today is Julie Chambers. She is an Indianapolis-based attorney and former president of the Hamilton Southeastern School Board. Additionally, she is the mom to two Hamilton Southeastern students, and she... At this time, welcome to the Who's Left podcast, Julie Chambers. Julie, how you doing? Good. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. Absolutely. It's a, a great to have you. So um, you were, until this past year, uh, a member of the Hamilton Southeastern School Board, yes? Yes. So I was originally elected in 2018, November, took my seat January 2019. Um, and then I ran for re-election and was defeated in 2022. So I was there for four years. And um, in this past election, um, we had uh, Moms for Liberty rear their head in Hamilton County. Uh, were, were they a thing before, um, like, the 22 election at all? Um, I think what we saw is similar to what a lot of communities saw across the country, um, that it, it sort of popped up pretty significantly in 2020 um, with the remote learning. Mm -hmm. And it kind of started with that, with the remote learning, the masks. Um, HSC was remote for a while, and then we went to like a hybrid. Um, so what we saw, I think, kind of started in Carmel um, with Unified Carmel, kind of that group. It kind of fed over into Fishers. Um, and then, again, what we saw, which I think is what most communities saw, transitioned once we were back in full time school in 2021 um they they had to find something else to focus on um so it continued to the schools and then moved into the the books and the libraries and it's just continued to kind of grow from there so um so first it was the the the, the masks and the, the the school shutdowns and the, yeah there was a lot of um if i remember that was like the big fight of uh, early early school year of of like 2021 or or were they already put yeah, so, for the end of the like the 1920 school year so we shut down what well, everybody shut down march 2020 so we ended that school year remote and then it was really into that fall coming back after the summer um it was still kind of the height of the pandemic and a lot of schools are trying to figure out what to do and that's when we kind of um hsc started virtual and then kind of moved to like a hybrid um, rotating schedule and then into 21 was kind of more in person uh so that's where it kind of focused then and then evolved in 2021 and then into 2022 kind of focused on those school board elections city council elections um local you know hyper local elections yeah did um did you start to hear like 
the critical race theory stuff pop up and like uh attacks on like diversity equity and inclusion or or was it yeah, or was it straight to like the 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 trans kids and the the copycat don't say gay stuff it started in 2021 with the crt and i think this is where we were able to kind of see at least myself and i think other people that were involved in education um saw that this while they a lot of these groups were trying to paint themselves as grassroots just parents trying to like, care about their kids because we were seeing the same argument across the country in districts that looked like ours others that were much smaller others that were larger but it was the same thing it was crt it was black lives matter after the um what happened then and it was the same thing though and so we knew it was all coordinated it was all coming from these national, um, highly funded groups that were kind of pushing out these scary terms to kind of scare people into thinking things were happening in our schools that were just not happening. And so that was kind of 20 and 21. Um, and then that kind of shifted, I think, with polling. They probably saw some of the stuff wasn't working anymore. <laughs> they had to find new things to scare parents with. And that's when we started seeing the anti-LGBTQ, the anti-trans bills, things like yeah. that shifting there. And now I think they're seeing that's also not working. And then they started shifting the books and libraries. And so it's it's just constantly trying to move the the goalposts and scare parents into just being terrified at their school. Yeah. So and and you know you you, you mentioned that um, you know the messaging was the same nationwide, and it, it, it you know coming from the top down uh, still. You know, these are locals in Hamilton County and the like, you know, the top down organization had to find willing participants. Um, like who who are these folks? Do they have kids in the district? Some I mean, I'm not gonna say nobody involved had to, you know, had didn't have kids in the district, but the vast majority of the people that I interacted with, especially during the last my campaign in twenty twenty two, um, were people that either are were retired and just don't have kids in the district. Maybe they have great kids here, um, but were people that were regularly in our buildings, people whose kids go to private schools, <laughs> uh, and people that just don't have children. Um, and like the the four board members that won the seats in our district, um, the person that that uh, that unseated me does have kids in the district. Um, one of the board members' kids go to private school. One does not have kids at all. Um, and another one has, I think, older kids or, or you know, are, are on their way out. So, and then we've got Fishers One, which was sort of that gra grassroots, I put in quotes, but um, group that popped up during COVID, um, which is run by people that, you know, are retired, older, again, are not in the buildings regularly day to day with kids seeing what's going on. Um, and so that's sort of where they got that push from. Sure. So, so they're they're not, you know, hearing their young ones come home with some horror story of, uh, you know, learning to feel guilty because they're white and therefore oppressors. This is literally stuff that no. folks are picking up off the do. Some will claim that they hear that from their kids. I, I don't believe that that's happening. I've never actually seen documentation that any of that's happening. The sad thing is of the people that I was interacting with, a lot of, um, in my, at least in my school board district, we have a very large kind of 55 plus community that votes nearly 100%. They're very engaged in the community. So I went to some speaking engagements there to meet with voters, meet with community members. And I was hearing from people retired 60s, 70s with PhDs coming to me telling me that they were convinced that for example, we had litter boxes in our schools for kids to identify as kids. <laughs> and just 100% convinced that this was happening. And I would look at them and say, listen, you know, you're educated and you're an intelligent person, right? Like, if this were happening, there would be pictures of this on Instagram. Like, do you honestly think these high schoolers would be blasting this out? But it's not out there because it, it doesn't exist. But they just were so convinced by... Breitbart or Fox News or, you know, and I'd say, well, where did you hear this? Well, my friend's grandkid told them. Like, well, okay, like, I didn't barely get my kids to tell me what's happening at school. 
hard for me to believe that like somebody's grandkid is coming to tell him when what's happening right like it's it was always i heard it from somebody i heard it from somebody um but they've just been so convinced that and the problem is that because it's the people that aren't in our buildings they don't have kids there they're not volunteering i mean i don't have any problem with people being involved in our schools who don't have kids or or, or, or are retired but if they're involved if they're volunteering if they're coming in to read to the kids if they were in the building they would see these wonderful environments where nobody is dressing up as a furry right it's just it's not happening um but because they read it in some right-wing blog or on facebook mm. um you know they were convinced it was true and it's really hard to disprove a negative. So, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, well, I guess armed with all of this disinformation that they come to the table with, um, what what does it look like when you get a uh, a hardcore right wing Moms for Liberty school? What 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 does that look like to the community? Yeah. So. It's hard. And, and I know there are people that on the other side of the aisle, you know, who may say, oh, Julie's just mad because she lost. And honestly, you know, not having to go to those board meetings every day has been a blessing. My my sweet eight year old at the time woke up the day after the election when I told her I lost. She cheered because I oh. um, was going to not miss her. You know, I wasn't going to miss the bus drop offs and the school pickups anymore because I wouldn't have all these meetings. So like, it, it's been, you know, kind of a wait. But the problem is that it doesn't just come down to disagreeing on what math curriculum we're going to use or what type of professional development to implement for our teachers. It comes down to campaign promises that were made to donors. Um, and we saw a giant influx of outside money coming to the school board race when in the past, uh, you know, my last school board election, the first one I ran, I spent about seven hundred dollars of my own money and raised about a thousand which at the time was a lot of money for a school board yes my opponent had spent just over 10 my opponent had spent just over ten thousand, right and i spent about 1700 that was a ton of money this last election you know they're spending 20 30 40 thousand dollars on a school board race and having sat in that seat for four years i'm sitting back thinking like you know you're getting paid couple hundred dollars a, a month maybe for your time what is what is in it for here but it's the, it's the promises that were made so they were giving um you know statements about getting rid of certain employees that they didn't like cutting positions um the person that won my seat um who defeated me we had hired a new superintendent in 2021 the night she was announced, before anybody knew who she was, he was out there with a sign saying, vote no, protesting her hiring. And the only thing people really knew at the time was that she came from, she originally, she came from Munster. She'd originally worked for IPS and she was a black woman. And we had people out protesting and, you know, they've come in and even now from the outside, obviously I'm not there, so I don't have all of the inside information anymore, but you see the employees at the meetings being asked to audit their own work for years back um getting records board members questioning every decision or every piece of information that's brought to them by these employees um bringing in outside consultants essentially to undermine the, the employees that we already have making it so they can't do their jobs that uh, i think their goal is to make them leave they can bring in their own people and a lot of the donors and a lot of the people that were running these campaigns are connected to charter schools and people that would support vouchers and so i think that's where this money is coming from um because especially if hsc is such a high performing district um that getting a a charter or some private school in here would be a huge get yeah yeah i mean the the normal right-wing attack about failing public schools does not work there so but, they have to but they be, did it they i mean that's in schools they like public right. schools and that's that's the thing i mean their whole campaign and there again there are four seats up for election this time and all four moms for liberty candidates won um carmel had a better showing or only one out of three so they they didn't flip the whole board but hsc did and part a huge part of their campaign was that hsc is a failing district that this new liberal board came in and all we're talking about is CRT and we're trying to like transition our kids or turn them gay or whatever scary story they're telling them and that we're failing and you need to elect a new board. 
well, we literally are not, we were never failing. We're one of the best public school districts in the state. Yeah, yeah. But again, if you're focusing your, if you're focused on voters who don't have kids in the district, it's really easy to pass those lies because they don't have any other information. Yeah. And didn't like every district everywhere in the country basically show, uh, you know, a decline in test scores from 20 to 21, just with the, the learning loss because oh, of COVID. Oh, 100%. Because of COVID and because Indiana switched standardized tests. And so what they would do is they show the test results from the old test and the test results from the new test and say, look at this giant decline. When in reality, you can't compare the two because they're completely different and they're graded differently. But again, if you don't have kids in the district, you don't have any basis to make that distinction. And so all you're seeing is this giant decline with no other information. Um, and trying to, But then in trying to reach those people and and go back and explain why the other side is wrong is just it's really difficult once they already have this misinformation kind of set um and so now what we're seeing is um employees leaving in droves um we're ha we're seeing you know teacher morale at an all-time low um we're trying to run a, a referendum we have a referendum on the ballot in november mm -hmm. which if our district loses that we'll lose over 20 million dollars in our budget which would be a huge hit to the district so we have people trying to pass that while we have a board that's every week throwing out some new crazy issue. We've, um, you know, we saw the moms feeling really quoting Hitler that was here in Hamilton County. Mm -hmm. um, these are all the same people um, that we're dealing with. And then now it's kind of morphed into the books and now into the library and the city council races too. Oh, well, uh, tell me about the uh, the library. Yeah, so in Hamilton County, it's really weird. At least our library district is kind of an anomaly. Um, here, our city commissioner, uh, our county commissioner, county council, appoint a couple of members to the Hamilton East Public Library Board. HSC gets one member that we appoint, and then Noblesville gets two. So it's kind of a weird setup. Most communities aren't quite like that, but it stems from a long time ago when Hamilton County was just very rural. Um, and so... When I was board president in my last year on the school board, our current representative resigned for personal reasons. So I had to appoint a new member of the library board. And that's sort of right when this attack on books started in schools. And again, it was here, but it was everywhere. I mean, if you go back, it was just national. It was all of a sudden this teachers have pornography in the schools and they're trying to like get your hit more. Right. And just in for the record, when, when right wingers do this, just for our listeners, when they when they say there's porn and inappropriate materials in the school, they 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 are talking about anything that even so much as references LGBTQ issues. Um, so so yeah, and I'll, I could give you an example of yeah yeah. What do you got? We had one person. We had we had one person who was constantly in our community sending complaints about well, these was constantly and. So I started reading the books he was complaining about because I thought, well, if he's getting to play and I'll just sit and read them. And one of them was called Middle School is a Drag. Mm. And it's a book geared toward middle school students, sixth through eighth grade, maybe. So I bought it and I read it and it was the sweetest story. I was crying at the end. My husband was laughing at me because I'm reading this like middle school book and I'm like crying on the back porch because it's just so, it was so touching. And it's just a story about this kid who's out and his parents support him and he meets his friend and his friend happens to do, he enjoys doing kid drag. So they dress up in drag and dance, but it's not sexual. Um, they don't talk about sex at all. Like it's just dancing to music and like, putting makeup on in a wig basically um and this boy's dad eventually at the end of the book comes to support his son and accept him for who he is and it's just a really touching story the closest thing to sex in the book at the end the main character gets a peck on the cheek from his crush like that's it kind of that's as far as it goes and it's such a sweet but he was writing about this on he's got his own blog writing about it calling it sexualized cross-dressing and that they're pushing with sexualized cross-dressing on your kids. And I just thought, you know, if anybody would read this book, the literally the only thing they can complain about is there is a gay character whose parent accepts them. And that's when it kind of hit me. I was like, this is what they're worried about. They're worried about kids reading that their parents will accept them no matter what. And that's not happening in every house. And so, you know, that's where it clicked for me. I'm like, this is just about keeping the world away from their own kids 
claiming that it's about parents' rights when really my rights as a parent are being trampled on because I want my kid to see the, the whole world. Um, you know, and they can they can hide their kid from the world. I don't want that. And as a public school or public library, I think they have a you know a responsibility to represent everyone. And these other people don't want that. Sorry, that was very- no, no. That's that's that's. <laughs> I get so passionate about this because it makes it just makes me so angry. It, it, it is. It, it's 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 infuriating. And then and now that's is that school library? Well, that's that's the the Hamilton East Library. They um had. Well, that book was in the school library, and, okay. but it's moved to the public library now, and they've started they started attacking our our main library, our head librarian. In the library. I, I understand that the, and then they got their mouth for liberty people pointed out the library staff didn't have, didn't they have to like do an audit of the entire teen section so the library board was okay they had one or two kind of very right-wing people um then they had some openings and then um I, I, somebody i'm sure you know might go back with got himself appointed to the board um tiffany ditlipson who's currently running for fisher, fisher city council got herself appointed um, a gentleman named Ray Madalone, who had been coming to our school board meetings complaining about things, got himself appointed. They took a majority of the public library board and then passed this new policy that essentially listed any curse word, said anything that had sex in it. Um, none of that could be in the teen section. So it basically required the librarians to pull the entire teen section and start paying people to read every book to see if it had any of these things in it. And that's when the uproar started when John Green found out the fault in our stars had been moved and he kind of pushed the narrative on Twitter that said this is this is not okay. Yeah, from from my perspective, seeing it you know, from outside of the greater Indianapolis area, that was kind of the mm-hmm. the jump the shark moment when you have the actual author of a banned book in your community uh push, pushing mm-hmm. back against it. And um and, have they backed off some since that happened? They did. I think we there were, there were a lot of people, not just myself, who were sounding the alarm when this was happening. Um, but again, getting people to pay attention to like what's happening at your public library board meeting is really hard. Uh, so John Green was kind of that catalyst that blew it up because of his platform. And because so many people here know him and, and love him, you know, like you said, he lives right here in Indianapolis, um, was really that catalyst that I think got people to wake up and, and said, you know, hang on, what is what is John Green complaining about? And the mayor finally kind of spoke out. Um, so our mayor has been very quiet. He doesn't get involved, which is really disappointing. But uh, but again, he donated to some of the school board members that won. So, I mean, uh, they're all connected. Uh, but yes, that was it. And so they they paused that policy um, for now. Um, their uh, legal counsel, who had just been hired, left because I think they were getting some heat from all of this. Um, so now they have to get new lawyers and reevaluate the policy. Um, you said they were paying people to audit all these books. That sounds pricey. The estimate, I think, was around 300000 um dollars to do this yeah i mean uh, the board members would say oh it's only going to be 150 or something but i mean at one point one of the board members suggested paying people five dollars a book to read these i don't think he really clearly he does not read because he doesn't know how long it actually takes to read a book i'm not sure what professional librarian would read a book for five dollars when they're supposed to be also doing their job but yeah hundreds of thousands of dollars to read every single book I remember when we got paid in personal pan pizzas to read. <laughs> oh, I was I was a kid. <laughs> oh, that was the best. Do they do they still do that? They don't do the booking anymore, do they? You know, they did. I think they might still. It's not quite as robust, but I think I had my kids doing it during COVID to get them to read. And it was like online. You got like an app now. You don't get like you need to get like the cool thing like that. Like I did a pen where I got. <laughs> and the right wing pizza shop has banned book it for every book you don't read you get a pizza right um so now school board library board these are non-partisan and supposed to be non-political positions and um and you said uh i know the name micah beckwith he's running for lieutenant governor and uh, as a Republican, and he is a very much uh, out 
proud Christian nationalist. Um, mm -hmm. And and then you, uh, Tiffany Ditlifson, you said, is uh, running for city council. Yeah, and she uh, has been a, she claims to be a founding member of Fisher's One, um, was until, at least as far as I know, still until a member of Moms for Liberty, um, has courted their support, um, but she's also on the library board. Um, and that was one of the things we saw in the school board race. I tried very hard to keep my race nonpartisan. I still 100% believe that school boards should stay nonpartisan. Um, there are board members I served with that I know pull a Republican ballot every year and are wonderful people. And I would fully vote for that as school board members because their focus was on the kids. I really don't. I don't think there's anything partisan there. Um, I was criticized because I was an active member of the Fisher's Democratic Club. Uh, but I was always honest about that and told people that I also told the Democratic Party in Hamilton County to not endorse me, to not donate money to me, don't put out flyers for me, and don't endorse or campaign because it is nonpartisan. I can do my political work, and I can do this too, and I can keep them separate. Um, my, my my opponent and the other Mount Philippi candidates did not feel the same way. And the Hamilton County Republican Party donated money, actively endorsed them, put out flyers, Facebook messages, events. Um, and they very much made it a, this is our Republican candidate, which I think is also how they got a lot of the vote out from like the, the non-parent types mm -hmm. because they just saw those are the Republicans. That's who we should vote for. Um, so I don't know what's going to happen with that in the future. And for the legislator, legislature will try to make it partisan. I, 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 hope I believe won't. this was brought up during this, this, the, the, the session this year, um, I, I don't. Did. They tried. Yeah, I don't, Every I, single speaker was against it. It didn't. And I, I'm sure they'll try again. And I hope it I hope it gets defeated again because it would be really, really disappointing for our, for our schools. I mean, maybe. But, you know, on the other hand, it could be a big, bright red flag telling you who not to vote for if they're going to behave this way. It could be. But I think Indiana already has a voting problem yes. and a turnout problem. And if we make it too easy for people to, to still not research who they're voting for and just vote at R or D. I think it just makes for lazy voters, lazy voting. So especially when it comes to our kids, because again, whether I'm a Democrat and I support, you know, democratic policies, again, if I'm there as a school board member, my only goal should be supporting the school district and the students. And whether somebody is pro life or pro choice or whatever, that doesn't affect your work on the school board. And it shouldn't and you shouldn't be bringing it into that heartily agree um so were were these folks i know they were actively supported by the the republican party had they been candidates before were these people known political quantities before they um inserted themselves into uh, education some of them so one of one of the leaders at Fisher's one um is a former hsc school board member from like years prior um no longer has kids in the district, but was on the school board. Um, Tiffany Pasco, who won this race, won ran two years ago and lost. Um, so she was sort of a repeat candidate. Uh, so she may have had some name recognition there. Um, most of them, though, are just were just people that you know started showing up during again 2020 mm -hmm. during the the shutdown things and kind of started getting connected to. I can't remember his name, Elvin Louie. He was in Carmel, but he sort of started that, that unified Carmel. Mm -hmm. or, I uh, yeah, I've, I've seen his name around, and, too. And then it, it kind of morphed over into Fishers. That's where it started. But I think a lot of them have been connected to the Republican, the county Republican Party. Okay. It's it's it, it's concerning. Um, like, like you said, these things should be nonpartisan. People should be able to compartmentalize um, and, and leave their um political and certainly their religious beliefs at home when they're um deliberating matters of public education i think i think one of the problems that we we've, we've seen here at least and i i think probably other districts are these candidates that come in who hadn't they hadn't really been coming to board meetings prior um clearly based on some of the things they said during the campaign didn't really know what was happening i mean a lot of bold statements about how you know, we're paying ex-employee three times the amount of 
this other employee when, you know, clearly that's not true. We're trying to inflate these ad- admin numbers saying we're just overpaying admin and we're not paying our teachers. And none of that was accurate. Um, but because they come in like that with kind of this ax to grind, like, oh, we've got to undo everything this liberal board did. We've got to undo everything this crazy board members did when they're indoctrinating our students. We've got to undo everything. There's really no goal or focus as to like looking towards the future. It's just about destroying. And in order to do that, you have to micromanage everything. And so we're seeing all of this these issues come up because the board members are trying to micromanage the district. And that is absolutely not their role as a school board member. But either they don't understand it, they're ignorant, or they just don't care um, to really understand their role. And so that's where we're seeing admin leave, teachers leave, because they're feeling like, the board doesn't trust me to do my job. Why should I stay here? And I think part of that is intentional on the board part because I think there are some people they want to make them leave. And then part of it's unintentional because I think we're going to see the exodus features. Because why would you stay in a district and the board is telling you you're indoctrinating our kids and we don't trust you to do your job? And that's where we're going to see a big um, a big issue when we can't fill those those rules. Yes. Um, how long are you all stuck with this situation? So it's going to be a while. That's the problem. <laughs> um, because they, these four members that just won will be there they, those four years. Yeah. Um, and it's a seven seat board. So at the very least, they're going to have a majority for four years, um, which is going to be a long time, particularly if the referendum does pass, because they're going to have a huge, huge role to try to figure out where to cut $22 million from our budget. Which is going to mean a lot of teachers get. That is insane. What What's the budget for the entire district? So HSC is one of the largest in the state. Our budget is, um, I don't remember exactly the numbers. You're looking around $250 million. Okay, so that's nearly 10% of the entire budget. It's it, it's it's huge district, and it would be a huge loss if we lost that, that amount. Um, because the that money, the referendum money, is directly used to support and pay our educators and so yes it would be a huge huge uh, loss and uh, not all of the current board members support the referendum which has been challenging and difficult so. absolutely unconscionable to me um yes when you're a board if, school board member yes uh, so um oh. the referendum vote is this year during the municipal elections is that correct yes november okay. Yes, so it'll be um, on the ballot. The language every year gets changed by the legislature a little bit to make it a little bit more difficult. So even though our board chose to reduce our referendum rate, the language in the ballot language will actually say we're raising taxes. So they like are constantly trying to make it more. To the, they they created a system where districts have to run referendums, and they created a system to make it really hard to pass them. Um, but yes, so it'll be on the ballot. So we're hoping to have a, a large showing from our community just to support our schools, regardless of what the board's doing. That's fantastic. And then um, the other three seats on the board, I imagine, come up uh, next year again? Next year. And those are the at-large ones. So in that election, the whole district votes for all three. So, all right. And we'll have, we have three incumbents. So we'll see how that goes. But I think the biggest takeaway is that just... History, I, I'm, I'm sure, you know, you'll you'll talk about this too, but history repeats itself and we've seen these groups. I mean, in the 50s, there was a conservative moms group out in California that was pushing the Red Scare and teachers were turning our kids communists. And, you know, in the 80s, we said, I mean, it's just, it's constantly repeating itself and I think we will get past it. But um, I think for the sake of our students and our kids, hopefully we get past it sooner rather than later. Yes, but, yes. Absolutely. Well, um, Julie Chambers, I want to thank you so much for joining the Who's Left podcast. It's been a pleasure. It was wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. That was Julie Chambers, attorney, former Hamilton Southeastern School Board president, and actual concerned parent. If you are in an Indiana county with a Moms for Liberty chapter and are seeing their effects, please reach out. I am at scottrodge 78 on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, if you're getting to me on Substack, you can also uh, comment below. Uh, if you're in Hamilton County and just want to talk about the the effects that you're seeing from the Moms for Liberty chapter, um, you know, I'm also uh, interested in your story. 
uh, please reach out. I will be back next week. I've got an interview with Indianapolis City Council candidate Jesse Brown. Looking forward to that one. In the meantime, it has been a pleasure. I will be back with you soon. Love each other again. Peace out. Thank you.